Hi, this is Richard from Original Outdoors. This is our 2018 updated guide to UK knife laws for an outdoor context. So, we've got a few things to look at here. The first thing is that UK knife laws can be, well, they're a bit weird, to be honest. They're quite restrictive in terms of what you can carry, but also they're quite vague in the wording. So I want to explain that, but the best way to explain it is just to read it out. I know I'm going to do something more energetic than that in a bit, don't worry. So basic laws on knives. It's illegal to sell a knife to anyone under 18 unless it has a folding blade 3 inches long, 7.62 centimeters or less. It is illegal to carry a knife in public without good reason unless it has a folding blade with a cutting edge three inches long or less. Carry, buy or sell any type of banned knife. Use any knife in a threatening way, even a legal knife. In Scotland, 16 to 18 year olds are allowed to buy cutlery and kitchen knives. Lock knives are not classed as folding knives and are illegal to carry in public without good reason. Lock knives have blades that can be locked and refolded only by pressing a button, can include multi-tool multi -tool knives, tools that also contain other devices such as screwdriver or can opener. Ban knives in the UK. It is illegal to bring into the UK, sell, hire, lend or give anyone the following. Butterfly knives, the fancy flippy foldy ones. Disguise knives, so things like... Um, a knife disguised in a belt buckle or a lipstick thing that's got a knife in it or something like that. Flick knives or switch blades or automatic knives, gravity knives, stealth knives, so a knife or spike not made from metal, so ceramic knives. And zombie knives, a knife with a cutting edge, a serrated edge, and images or words suggesting that it is used for violence. Yeah, Knuckle dusters, quite a long list. Within an outdoor context though, most of that doesn't apply the second bit of the banned weapons part but the first bit you really need to be aware of so I have five knives in front of me which I carry for my work and have all been carried in a public place in some way so the break point is actually here everything that side of the line means something everything that side of the line means something else this is a Victorinox well, it's a Swiss Army knife. It has a folding, non-locking blade. You just press on the back and it closes. It's sharp, it's razor sharp, shaving sharp, like, well, most of my regular cutting tools. But that's it. It has a small blade here as well, which I never really use. And it's got the usual screwdriver, can opener, corkscrew, tweezers, toothpick, that kind of thing. So that's a folding, non-locking blade of less than three inches. This is a handmade sheath knife it's quite a long blade um, this was made for me by a friend to meet my huge hands and it's a knife i use most weeks with clients of one type or another and out here in the woods and on a few other things this is a getting on a bit now gerber multi-tool that i've had to repair and fix the screws on several times the belt clip doesn't work has all the usual multi-tool bits including a not very long but folding locking blade there's a small button i have to press there to close it an opinel one of these weird ones where they've dyed the handle green folding it locks with a rotating collar not a button which is a locking blade there's debate about whether that is classed the same as other locking knives and this magnum bokeh bokeh I don't know, it was a cheap knife, but I actually had this as part of my regular mountain rescue kit. I had two knives that I carried. One was a Gerber folding rope rescue knife, which has a completely blunt tip and very aggressive serrated edges in a folding locking blade that was with my rope kit. And then this, which actually lived well, most of the time on my radio chest harness. I used to have a chest rig with VHF radio and torch and a few other things, and then airwave set if I was carrying one. And then that, was tucked into it. So this is a folding locking blade with a slight curve. It's quite a solid blade. It can be used one-handed quite easily. There's a clip to hold it and a seat belt cutter and one of those hardened press studs so you could use it to break glass. To be honest, in rescue terms, it was more often used for getting into cable ties and that kind of thing, including loaning it to a police officer so they could cut into their own equipment to get something out because they weren't carrying a knife. Five knives that I regularly carry. I have other knives, I have wood carving knives and spoon gouges and all sorts of axes and things, but 
this covers most of the common uses. So that's the break point there. As I read out, anything more than that, anything more than a folding non-locking blade with an edge of less than three inches, I have to have a good reason as to why I'm carrying it. So all of these here, if I'm carrying them in a public place, I need to have a good reason as to why I have them. This, as long as I'm not using it as a weapon, as long as I'm not using it in a way that can cause alarm or distress to a member of the public, as long as I'm not, it can't really be perceived as a weapon, then it's up to a police officer and if I do end up being arrested for carrying that, someone else and the CPS and the courts and whoever it is down the line to tell me and to prove why I can't carry that. However, the onus is on me, the pressure is on me to explain why I am carrying those in that location. So, mountain rescue knife, well I could explain why I had it. I could explain why I had it as I handed it to the police officer because they didn't have a knife. The Opinel, well it's light and it's really quite sharp and it's the perfect sort of skinning, gutting knife for a very small game. Um, and it's just a nice lightweight knife. The multi-tool, well, it's just very, very useful. As you can see how battered and scratched this one is, this gets used a lot. I've used it to repair the car, I've used it to fix the photographic equipment and undo those little grub screws on tripods and things. And the mechanical advantage of those pliers is, well, it's difficult to get past. Being able to cut through wire with it, it's all very useful. And having a cutting tool there is very useful too. And then a fixed blade knife, well, it does something that the others can't, and that's give you confidence that it's not going to close onto your fingers and cut into tendons and give you a life-changing injury. So a fixed blade knife is perfect for wood carving, doing some serious cutting work, and skinning and preparing large game. I can explain why I have those when I'm using them, but I would need a good reason to carry them. Just because well, I was out walking yesterday and these are the same trousers and it's still in my pocket now when I'm in Tesco or the pub or whatever. That's not a good reason. Laziness is not a defence. The same goes for all of these. Just having them, oh, it's always in my kit and it's always there, isn't a good reason. My mountain rescue knife, and that was used, that lived with my radio chest harness and it came back into the house to charge the radios and... It was next to my mountain rescue equipment and it lived in the back of the car but it was always locked in the boot and it was never really on display and it just lived there like the rest of my rescue equipment. I didn't wander around in the supermarket or in the pub wearing that because, well, I'd look like an idiot but also I wouldn't have a good reason for doing it. Same goes for that, same goes for that knife. I need to have a good reason for why I'm carrying them. So if I'm walking in the mountains, I wouldn't really carry something like this because it's big and heavy and I, there's nothing I'm going to cut that I need well that kind of cutting power and that kind of confidence I'd carry something like that or that or even that but if I needed a fixed blade or a locking blade for whatever thing I was doing then I'd carry something like that but I wouldn't just carry it and then still have it on my person several days later it goes out with my walking kit or my mountaineering kit and it lives in the rucksack, it doesn't live in my pocket generally. And when I'm done with whatever I'm doing, it goes back in the kit store or on the shelf or in the corner of the living room or wherever else your kit lives. It lives with it. It's not something I generally carry. If I need a day-to-day -day knife for small tasks and opening packets and cutting string and that kind of thing, then that does the job. And I'm legally allowed to carry that in the UK. But that's the important break point. Anything more than a folding, non-locking blade of three inches, it's up to you to justify why you've got it. Anything less than that, then it's up to someone else to tell you why you shouldn't have that. Assuming you're not using it as a weapon or brandishing it or using it to, say, you're carrying it for self-defence or whatever reason that's outlined there. There are some changes uh, that are just about to come in around knives in the UK. The, a lot of it doesn't actually apply to an outdoor context because the things that affect where you can carry things and what you can carry is remaining unchanged. Um, the big one really is that up until now you could order a knife online and there'll be normally some kind of age verification declaration but the criticism was that it, that wasn't being done properly. Um, before you could order a knife online and say you were over 18 and have it sent to your home address. 
Um, and yeah, that's just how it, would, how it would work. What's changing is that you won't be allowed to send knives to a home address. Um, it can only go to a business address. So the uh, thinking behind that is, I think, that it prevents people buying knives quietly and just getting them sent to their address anonymously under the age of 18 and then with have owning a knife without any much of a trail back to them um, but still allowing businesses to order knives for work and for resale but it will just kill the mail order to home knife industry although what will probably happen um, and assuming that this is still allowed within the law that people will just get their knives that they buy online sent to work Another change is that it's going to be illegal to carry a knife of any kind on a, a, higher, a, a, a higher education establishment or campus. Uh, it has been the case in schools, but it's going to go to that. There are a few other changes around the definition of those illegal weapons and what's illegal to own and to, to buy and that kind of thing. But in an outdoor context, it's not actually changing that much. The things that really do affect the outdoor recreation and professional user have been the case for a while and will remain the case. Folding non-locking blade of less than three inches, you can carry it in generally in a public place. Fixed blade, locking blades, it's up to you to have a good reason as why you're carrying that. It's probably also worth thinking about what you're doing in terms of trespass and things like that because people wild camp and go to find huge acres of woodland that you can't really find the landowner and maybe go and have a sneaky overnight in a bivy bag there and there's the whole micro adventure thing and getting out of London and just going sleeping in a bivy bag on the side of the South Downs or somewhere quietly not disturbing anybody not causing any problems the landowner doesn't know you're there and wouldn't know you have been there because you've you've followed the practices of leave no trace and you've not had a fire and you just quietly lay down, slept for the night, taken some photos at sunrise and walked off again. Even though you don't have the right to camp there, it's technically trespass. Trespass is just a civil offence. But if you're carrying that, does that make it armed trespass? No doubt there'll be a debate about that in the comments below and it depends on the case and whose land you're on and all of those other things. But You've got to think about these things in a wider context, particularly as knives are being seen less and less by the general public as tools and more by, as, well, weapons and knives, because that's how they're being talked about by the media, by politicians and by everyone else. For me, these knives are all tools. They are five very useful tools to me, and they are as useful as my rucksacks and my sleeping bags and my tents and my ropes and my kayak and my canoe and my mountain bike, my camera equipment, my waterproofs. They're tools. They're tools that can be misused and they're tools that I need to take care of and they'll take care of me. So that's the end of it really. That's the end of the basics for UK knife law. It's not changing a great deal for an outdoor user, but you should be aware of where that breakpoint is between the folding non-locking blade of less than three inches and everything else and why you have a good reason about carrying it. So that's the end of the knife law section. I'm going to go to the next bit, which is my opinion on the whole thing. So if you don't want to watch that, you can turn off now. Thank you for watching. Uh, but if you want to see my opinion, then keep watching. Okay, so that was the law bit. This is my personal opinion, because I don't really talk about, in the tutorial videos, I, you know, we laugh and joke and say things, but we don't. I don't really talk about my views on political matters and cultural matters and other things. But... I think in this case it's appropriate to because, well, the last time, this isn't the first video on knives that I've made for this channel. The last time we made a video, it was a short, simple video, very similar, knives on the table talking about can you carry this, can you carry that, and all sorts of things. That video led to more comments on the channel than anything else we've put online. They look something like this. And that video also led to people well, contacting me at work, because this is um, this is a YouTube channel, but it's the YouTube channel of my business, Original Outdoors, and run training courses and have clients and have an office and all sorts of things, which are linked to from the channel. The website's easy to find, and I'm using my real name. People were finding me at work and contacting work, to not to discuss courses or to inquire about things, but to discuss that video in particular, because they, for some reason, disagreed with something in that. And the video was pretty much the same. We read out the laws, 
talked about the knives, folding, non-locking, less than three inches, that was about it. But people feel very passionately about this subject, and not only did they call work, but they arrived there, and arrived at the office, which is interesting when somebody suddenly arrives at your place of work, a complete stranger, and wants to discuss their opinions on knives and self-defence with you. Um, that's a weird one. So I wanted to address that in this video. So there are various knives here, the knives I use in an outdoor setting and two others. I grew up in a rural house and a rural family and we had firearms in the house and we had firearms at relatives' houses and most of my family have owned guns of one type or another and were also serving police officers and uh, worked within the law or the armed forces or various other things and were hunters and farmers and worked in the outdoors and worked in the countryside and had their firearms there as a tool of their business or as a sporting tool. They weren't really seen as weapons, they weren't there for self-defense, they were there as a tool. But throughout the 80s and into the 90s various incidents happened and very tragic incidents that led to the UK laws on firearms changing. So it went through the point, so there were various amnesties at that time which my family and just did what everyone else did, every other law-abiding firearms owner, and just handed everything in because you didn't really have much of a choice because the penalties for not doing so were so high um, that that was it. So that's what changed. And alongside all that, we've used knives, we've used cutting tools um, in the same way that I do every day now, and that no doubt my children will if they follow me into this career or doing something similar to it. So knives are part of my everyday life. But it's also a part of other people's lives every day for different reasons. Um, you can't argue that uh, the knife crimes and violent crimes involving knives has gone up in the UK in the last, uh, last well, in a recent period. Mostly around London, um, mostly or other large urban areas in the UK. I don't think knife crime in rural areas like this has actually increased that much. And it's the definition of that knife crime. It's not necessarily people stabbing each other or threatening each other or cutting each other. It could be someone illegally carrying a knife for, or not having a good reason for carrying a lock knife in a public place as part of another crime they were committing. I mean, that when you look at the statistics, if you take out those kind of things where someone was in possession of an offensive weapon or a, an illegal knife because they didn't have a good reason for it, then that drops the crime rate and the perceived crime rate down quite a bit. But I can't argue that those those figure, those numbers have gone up. Um, and I live in a rural area. I live somewhere without street lights and where you can walk outside at night and all you can see is stars. Um, it, I live in a completely different place to London and to big urban areas, so I don't have much experience of what it's like living there. Um, I carry knives for work legally, but I don't think the way that knives are portrayed in the media, in the news, um, and the discussion about knives from, well, mostly driven by people who live and work in towns, because that's where most people do live and work. If you're not used to knives, if you're not used to carrying knives as a tool for everyday use in an outdoor context, and you know, talk to most of the farmers around here, they'll have something like that in their pocket. I mean, some of the farmers I know, they're probably carrying it for the day they accidentally get their arm trapped in the baler and they've got to cut it off by hand. That's what they're like around here. They, most, if you're not used to working with knives in and out as a tool, if your only experience with knives are either the quite scary stories coming in about knife crime on the rise and all these violent crimes and just as something in your kitchen that lives next to your toaster and your chopping boards then something like that can be seen as being quite scary and I've had this on courses and some media things when I've been doing some work on TV where I've said oh, I'll need the knife for that and I pulled the knife out and once had a producer sort of rock back in shock and she said that's illegal you can't carry that and I had to explain to her yeah yeah, in this context, I can. If you're not used to use, seeing knives, then any knife is a potentially scary thing. And I think rather than educating people that some knives are tools, um, and that rather than 
restricting access to knives and the way you can get them and the changes and how they're delivered and you can't have them delivered to your house and zero tolerance and every other emotive thing that people say about knives in the UK at the moment. Rather than restricting that access and um, making everything into a weapon or to be seen as a weapon, I think what we should be doing instead is addressing why people are carrying knives as weapons. This tiny minority that are carrying knives, why are they doing that? Why are they so afraid that they feel they need a knife as a self-defence item? Because, well, talk to anyone who does stuff in self-defence and um, that kind of training. A knife is a terrible weapon for self-defence anyway. <sighs> knife fighting, and it doesn't work like it does in films. If you're carrying a knife for self-defence against someone else with a knife, you're both going to end up being cut and stabbed. It's not going to go well. So, a knife is a terrible weapon for self-defence anyway. And... <sighs> If you're carrying it, it's not the item you're carrying that's the problem, it's your motivation for doing it. It's your If you're carrying it for self-defence or to harm someone else, well, tackle why that person feels a need to defend themselves in that way, why they feel afraid enough that something could happen, that they need to defend themselves, or that they want to attack someone else. Um, I think violent tendencies are part of human nature, but so are many other things, and we've managed to create a society where we can overcome a lot of those tendencies through through rule of law tackling the reasons why people want to carry knives isn't easy and i don't really have any quick answers um but i suspect it takes longer than the average election cycle um and it takes longer much much longer than the well the, the several hours that is a news cycle now people want responses from the police from politicians um and from the people that we elect and have to, to make decisions for us. People demand responses from them, and they want responses to a perceived problem quite quickly. If you say, right, we're going to tackle the problems in this community or as a, as a nation as a whole that we think we have, and it's going to take 25 years, no one's really going to vote for that, or that's not going to survive beyond the next election, because most long-term plans don't. People want to be able to feel like they've had a response to a problem quite quickly. And politicians, whether through desire or just because that's the world they have to work in, have to respond to well quick quick questions with quick answers, and they have to feel like they've they have to show that they've done something. And I think that the changes in UK knife law aren't going to make a, much of a difference where there is a problem with violent knife crime, but it is going to affect people who knife makers and people who buy knives and buy well. This was from a friend, and I went to his house to collect this after he made it for me. But if I'd bought a knife from Ben Orford or one of the other many fantastic craftspeople we have making knives here in the UK, I would have had to have that delivered to my office address, not my home address. It just added a step in there that was an inconvenience to me um, and could potentially reduce the number of sales for the craftsperson who's built a successful small business, providing income back into the economy around their craft it might reduce their sales as well. So the changes in the law are going to affect people like that and people who buy knives for outdoor recreation and for work and people who sell them as part of their business. I don't think it's going to affect people in, well, people who are committing violent crime because rather than buying a weird zombie killer knife or something else, they're probably just going to keep using stuff like this, which is a kitchen knife. This is one of my knives from home. It's not even a very good knife. These aren't my good knives. I'm not allowed to take those out of the house, apparently. This is the cheap set of knives. I think the whole knife block costs less than £10. Um, they're from a supermarket, and they're good backup knives for doing things that I don't want to put my nicely stropped and honed knives anywhere near. But of all the knives on this table, if, I want to be, if the one I'd want to be stabbed by the least is that one, the cheapest one here. It's a fixed blade knife. I don't have a good reason for carrying it, but I'm guessing that you have something similar to that at home. And it's cheap steel, it's very cheap steel, very cheap, mass, produ mass produced, but being stabbed by that, well, that's going to give you a very large wound, and it goes in a long way. If that pretty much goes from one side of me to the other. You still can't get that sent to a home address through mail order now, but you could steal one from every kitchen. I could also come under criticism for, well, not living somewhere with a violent knife crime issue and where, you know, do I have much right to 
discuss what's happening in London and other cities where knife crime is potentially an issue, do standing here in a remote woodland in North Wales where knife crime isn't a problem, sheep r rustling and sheep worrying is actually more of a problem here, um, do I have much of a right to talk about that? Well, if you come along on one of the courses and you ask me nicely, I might take my shirt off to show you, and you asked me that question, to show you the scar I have here on my shoulder there, across the top of my pectoral, and down here on my rib cage. That was from about just over 10 years ago now, um, where I was attacked whilst intervening in someone kicking his girlfriend to death in a pub car park somewhere in rural Shropshire. I was coming, walking past, not drinking, not doing anything, just happened to be walking past, and I saw something happening I went over to intervene and the guy turned round with a knife in his hand and slashed me across my chest there. Stitches and all sorts of things. And that was done with something, well, almost identical to this. It was a, one of these retractable Stanley knife type blades. He'd stolen that from work. It was something, it was something he acquired anonymously and could ditch and he had it in his hand for the express purposes of injuring somebody. And so... I've been a victim of knife crime. I have injuries, I have a scar, probably for life. I mean, I don't take my shirt off in public that often, so I don't get much of a tan. But when I do get a tan and I have been working somewhere where my, <laughs> my skin starts to get browner, I've got a nice pale line here. Most of it's covered under chest hair and things, but it is there, and if you come and see me in person, I'll show it to you. But that was done, well, with the equivalent of a kitchen knife. It was a cheap disposable blade that he had access to anonymously that was there for part of his work and if he wanted a knife to cause a crime and to commit a violent crime with he had access to one it had nothing to do with an outdoor context and carrying that in your rucksack whilst getting on the train to go and do some hill walking in the Lake District and that's part of the problem because decisions are made in cities by people who don't tend to do much hill walking although our current prime minister apparently is a keen hill walker i'm guessing she doesn't carry something like that then changes in uk law and making knives the access to knives more restrictive i don't think it's going to make a blind bit of difference because if that was well if that happened again tomorrow the guy who slashed me could still access that from work and you can still steal a knife from a kitchen. The problems with knife crime aren't the knives. The problems with knife crime are the reasons people are carrying them. And that's what we need to address, not the tools. So thank you for watching. That was a slightly different video to normal, um, to our other tutorials. Um, but that's what we do as a channel. Mostly it's tutorials. I Original Outdoors is a training and outdoor skills company. We're based up here in North Wales on the edge of Snowdonia. If you have a look at the website, there's all sorts of courses uh, and there's blogs on there. On the YouTube channel, it's mostly tutorials, um, gear reviews and some trip reports and things, but there's more stuff going on there all the time. That's what I do for work. That's what the video was. If you managed to make it all the way to the end, thank you very much for sticking around through my waffling. And yeah, if you want to like this video and subscribe to the channel and share it with other people, that would be great. If you want to share it on forums and Facebook and if you think other people will find this useful or want to discuss it, that's great if you can do that. But if you just want to watch this and then go on to the next video, then that's fine too. Again, thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.